Welcome back to the London Futurist podcast. Our guest in this episode is Matt Burgess. Matt is an assistant professor at the University of Wyoming, where he moved this year after six years at the University of Boulder, Colorado. He's specialised in the economics of climate change, and I think we'll have an interesting discussion about that. We met at a recent event in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I know from our conversations then that he also has thought deeply about the impact of social media, the causes of populism, and many other subjects. So, Matt, welcome to the London Futurist podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Nice to meet you, Matt. Nice to meet you, too. So, Matt, let's start with your personal story. You were born and raised in Canada, and you moved to the US after your undergraduate degree. Now, Canadians are sometimes described as Americans who don't have guns and do have health care. So why did you make the move south? Well, I think like many immigrants to the United States, the short answer is opportunity. When I was looking to go to graduate school, a lot of what matters in many graduate programs is actually less what school you're at and more which advisor you work for, which PhD mentor you work for. There were a couple of mentors at the University of Minnesota, which I really wanted to work for and was fortunate to have the opportunity to work with them. And then, yeah, I didn't have a strong inkling of staying in the U.S. or leaving in the U.S. I just followed the opportunity and ended up staying. So I went to California first and then Colorado and then here. It's obviously an interesting time to be in the U.S. How are you enjoying the election debates? I may be a little bit more optimistic than some people are about this country. I'm working on a writing project called How Polarization Will Destroy Itself, where basically my thesis in a nutshell is that people are getting sick of the extremism more than we realize and more than the algorithm on X allows us to see, regardless of what side you're on. Obviously, it's an important election. There's a stark contrast between the two candidates in many different areas. But I think either way, whichever side wins, Overall, the trend is going to be gradually down from the height of polarization that we maybe had three years ago or so, just because people are so sick of it and it doesn't actually deliver results. Extremism doesn't on the things that it claims to be for. Yeah, yeah. Extremism doesn't make America great. Setting fires in the U.S. Capitol building doesn't make America great, doesn't improve our standing in the world. And demonizing the police and keeping schools closed for a long time turns out isn't very good for social justice, just as two examples. And I think people are realizing that. Yeah, I think that's a very good take on populism. And I want to get into that in a while. But first of all, let's start with climate change, because that's your area of speciality. Yeah. And at Boulder University, you were a colleague of Roger Pielke. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Pilkey. Pilkey or Pelkey, I've heard. Pilkey. Who is a very well-known climate scientist and often described as a lukewarmer. Now, as I understand it, what that means is that he thinks four things. One, global warming is real. We are causing it, and we have to take it seriously and try to understand it better. Two, forecasts of catastrophe, especially imminent catastrophe, are exaggerated. Three, economic growth and technological advances will enable us to adapt and blunt a lot of the impact, but we shouldn't be complacent. And four, the policy demands of many climate activists are not only unnecessary, but damaging. Is that about right? Have I expressed that fairly? And is that roughly your position as well? So let me both accept and reject the premise of your question in different ways. <laughs> so the first is the label of lukewarmer or any kind of label. I think the climate discussion has too many labels. And I think most of the labels in the climate discussion are created to silence people whose views you don't like. Whether that means calling people a lukewarmer or calling people a catastrophist usually what you're trying to do is not engage with their views. So I reject the label of lukewarmer for Roger or for anybody else. Let's go through your four statements. So number one, absolutely. Global warming is real. We are causing it and we must take it seriously and try to understand it better. Obviously, there are many things that contribute to what happens in the climate, but estimates I've seen suggest that roughly 100% of the recent warming trend is attributable to human greenhouse gas emissions. And actually, if you account for the fact that we've also been emitting aerosols that cool the planet, the planet actually hasn't warmed as much as our emissions would otherwise have caused it to. And this is a serious problem. It's true, as some people say, that the climate is always changing, but the timescales are really different. It's really different to have climate change over 
10 to 100,000 year timescales and have climate change over 50 to 100 year timescales, both for us and for other aspects of life. So it's definitely a serious problem. Forecasts of catastrophe, especially imminent catastrophe, are exaggerated. I think this one is mostly right too. And one of the things that I find most frustrating about climate discussions is that we seem to be stuck in this false binary. So let me give you an example or an analogy that I think clarifies this. COVID-19. Nobody would deny that COVID-19 was one of the worst economic and humanitarian disasters in at least a generation. And yet also, I think no one would dispute the suggestion that COVID-19 came nowhere close to collapsing human civilization globally. Those are obvious things. So why is it that in some climate discussions, it feels like you have to either be saying climate change is going to collapse global civilization imminently, or it's not a problem? Would anybody who says that COVID didn't destroy the world governance system also say that COVID wasn't a big deal? Of course, it was a big deal. So climate change is a big deal, but ideas that it is high on the list of things that could collapse global civilization this century, say, I do think are exaggerated. And not only that, and this is something that Roger Pilkey and I have collaborated on, a lot of the impact studies that are out there use results from climate scenarios that come from emission scenarios that are very unrealistically hot. And it's not hard, I think, to explain to a lay person why they're unrealistic. For example, the scenario RCP 8.5 or its successor SSP 5 8.5 is used in about 90% of impact studies. That was one assessment that I did in my subfield. And it requires you to believe that in 2100, the following three things will be true at the same time. Number one, will be so rich and so equal globally that everybody, including the poorest parts of the world today, will have a GDP per capita of over $120,000 in 2005 US dollars. And we need to be that rich to demand enough energy, number one. Number two, we also, to get that hot, need to be that rich and need to turn off all the climate policies we have today, turn off many of the technological improvements that we have today and things like renewables and fracking, have a coal bonanza for the entire century, and be completely unconcerned about climate change. And then three, if we really got as hot as this scenario projects we would get, large parts of the tropics where huge fractions of the global population live would be basically impossible for humans to live in outside for more than a few minutes for over 300 days a year. So to believe this scenario, you have to believe that we're going to be extremely rich, extremely unconcerned about climate change and cooking all at the same time. I and Roger and others suggest that's not going to happen. So can I push back a bit on that? Yeah, please do. Isn't it the possibility of what people call tipping points? Doesn't that need to be factored in? We don't know how close we are to various climate tipping points, and it may not need a linear extrapolation of current emissions. It may just be that a small addition to the emissions will push the global oceans into a different mode, will push the airstream patterns into a different mode, will accelerate the emission of long-buried methane, will change how the great forests are handling oxygen and so on. And we don't know enough about it. And so isn't there the risk that we'll get to a catastrophic change without having to do all the things you've just mentioned? That's a good question. And it's really two separate questions. Whether, say, two and a half to three degrees of warming, which is with median climate sensitivity, on the pessimistic end of where we might be headed with current and stated policies. Whether that crosses tipping points is a separate question from whether four and a half to five degrees of warming by 2100 with median climate sensitivities is realistic. I'm saying that the latter is not realistic. In terms of the tipping point question, I think we should be concerned about tipping points. Methane is one, although I believe ones like this Ones that have to do with warming, catalyzing more warming, like methane release, are factored into some climate sensitivity projections. And so we might get a degree warmer than we expected because of those kinds of things. There's certainly other things we should be concerned about, like collapse of the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet. I'm getting a little bit out of my expertise in terms of the nitty gritty of the physical science. And there's a debate about these tipping points and how close we are to them. Because physical science isn't really my expertise, I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole of saying this one's more realistic than that one. For example, 
as far as I understand it, we're pretty far from the tipping point around clouds. That's one we should be pretty worried about if we ever got close to it. I think that there's a debate about how close we are to tipping points around some of the ocean circulations in the North Atlantic related to basically ice melting and moving currents southward. If we cross that tipping point, actually, I think make Europe quite a lot colder, which is interesting and counterintuitive. And then the ice sheet ones and the sea level rise, as far as I understand, we don't really know. And, and there's a debate. And I think this really gets back to the global warming is real and serious point. There's this famous theorem in economics called the Dismal Theorem that says that even a small chance of a catastrophic outcome is worth taking really seriously. But I think on the other side of it, we have to consider the fact that it isn't costless to exaggerate the threat. And I think that's an unstated assumption that happens in a lot of climate discourse that, well, you know, if we exaggerate the threat, then we'll just fix the world faster and great. But if you look at history, we were really worried in the 60s and early 70s about overpopulation. There were some pretty catastrophic books put out, The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich, The Limits to Growth by Meadows. These prognostications were part of the motivation for things like the one child policy, for eugenic policies in other countries that really caused a lot of devastation, and the projections turned out to be wrong. There's a recent case in Sri Lanka where the government tried to ban synthetic fertilizer because they were worried about the impacts of pollution, and they had been sold the story that organic was the solution, and that caused a hunger and economic crisis. So I guess we need to be concerned, but we need to be careful about assessing the risk and also not taking for granted the fact that our society has become enormously prosperous over the last 200 years, has made huge gains in well-being in almost every region of the world. And so far, fossil fuels have been a big part of that story, even though the technology is getting better. And I'm optimistic that we're at or close to a tipping point where soon that won't be true anymore. I just want to hone in on one of the three things you said there. As you said, the three things have to happen for ICV 8.5 to become real. And the second one was stop all climate policies. One of the things I am always surprised about is how many people say we're not doing anything. We're not doing anything to tackle global warming, climate change. And yet everywhere I go, I see amazing amounts of solar panels and wind farms. And I read that, for instance, half of all Europe's electricity last year was generated by renewable sources. So we are doing a very great deal. We are actually moving the economy from fossil fuels to renewables. Undoubtedly not fast enough, probably not smart enough in all sorts of ways, and we need a lot more research. But there is work going on, isn't there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head that the glass is half empty and half full, and definitionally those two mean the same thing. We definitely have made enormous technological progress. I think in 10 years, the cost of solar power has dropped by over 90% or something. More than that, I think. Batteries are on an exponential growth curve. Wind is growing, not as fast as solar, but it's growing really fast. There have been a lot of policies, such as the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, which is spending a huge amount of money on this. If you look at major forecasts from energy agencies of what's going to happen to coal, what's going to happen to renewables, they tend to have a large pessimistic bias. They have drastically underestimated how quickly solar would increase, for example, and they have somewhat less drastically, but still pretty significantly overestimated the viability of coal in terms of preventing its decline, continuing its rise in some forecasts. Yeah. And same thing with adaptation. Just in low-income countries, the child mortality rate has fallen by two-thirds since 1990. That's amazing. The death rate from natural disasters has fallen enormously, I think well over 90% in the last 100 years. The damage rate compared to GDP from natural disasters has fallen, I think, by almost a third since the 80s globally. In both cases, it's fallen faster in middle and low income countries than in high middle and high income countries. And that, I think, is largely an economic growth story. We get better at adapting and we have better technology and better infrastructure as we get richer. And except in the very poorest countries, the economic growth rates year over year and GDP per capita are highest in middle and low middle income countries. So we have adapted a lot. But to the point about complacency, that's an important but. We have not yet seen the kinds of sea level rise that you might see 
if we got unlucky with tipping points related to major ice sheets, for example. David, do you want to do a bit more of your pushing back? I want to quote another Canadian, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England. Sure. Who did say that in some ways we are doing better as a civilization than expected against the threat of climate change. We have accelerated the adoption of renewables faster than most people expected. Yep. And indeed, we are better at adaptation. So in one aspect, we've done better. But his expression, and I can't remember the exact words, was at the same time, the science has got more uncertain. And whereas previously we thought we would be safe enough with two or two and a half degrees, but the uncertainty over that has multiplied as people have seen things happening in the climate that we don't yet fully understand. And after all, haven't there been, not in history, but in deep prehistory, instances of very rapid climate change as various things happened? People talk about things that you can just about read out of past history in terms of rapid increases in temperature. I think that's his concern, and that's one I personally share. I think we're doing wonderfully, but we're not doing enough, and we do need to draw attention to the possibilities, even on covid You said, well, things didn't go too bad in the end with COVID, despite all that turmoil, but it could have been worse. There could have been variants of COVID that turned out to be more lethal and which the vaccines could not defend against. So there's a big range of variation that could come from just a small change in the forcing factors. Yeah, so a couple of comments on that. First, I think your pushback on what I said about COVID is playing into this false dichotomy I was saying. I never said COVID wasn't a big deal or wasn't so bad. My point was just that it was really, 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 really bad. And yet something that would collapse civilization would have to be that much worse, was kind of my point. So related to Mark Carney's comment, yeah, this comes back to the fact that a glass that's half full is definitionally also half empty. We are way off track for the one and a half degree aspirational goals from Paris. If we continue to accelerate policy and technological progress along the trajectory that we have been so far and that the International Energy Agency projects we might to 2050, then we might get close to two degrees with median climate sensitivity. So that target is not completely out of reach, I don't think. In terms of the question of surprises, I think you're right that there's a debate And I've read papers both that say that tipping points are closer than we think and papers that say either no, they're not, or what we think of as a tipping point might still take hundreds of years to manifest and and will adapt. That's not really my area of expertise to really be able to adjudicate who's right, but certainly we should be concerned and we should be continuing to do what we can to adapt and to mitigate. I think we've covered points one to three. We maybe have covered point four, which was that the policy demands of many climate activists are not only unnecessary, but damaging. Possibly cover some of that, but I don't know if you want to comment on that. I do, actually, because this is where you sent, in preparation for this episode, a list of folks that have been dubbed lukewarmers, again, even though I reject that and all other labels. This is where I think I have some disagreements with some folks who have been given this label. So we should name those people. We're talking about Bjorn Lomborg, Matt Ridley, Judith Curry, Richard Toll, among others. And by the way, these folks all have disagreements and diversity of views among each other. Sure. They're not a monolith. But yeah, so the policy demands of many climate activists are not only necessary, but damaging. I would say it depends on who you're talking about and what demands you're talking about. Well, sure. But there's a fairly strong school of thought, which says we are taking an unacceptable risk with the climate. And therefore, we should stop economic growth. The degrowth movement is quite large. So just stop economic growth. That, I think, falls well under the heading of unnecessary and damaging. So again, I'll go back to it depends on who you're talking about. That's an example of a school of thought that's fairly prominent in some corners of academia, but not super prominent in policy and politics, except for the occasional conference in the EU. I don't want to overstate the prominence of some of these ideas in policy. Well, actually, let's just look at that again. Jill Stein has probably been responsible for choosing the US president for the last three elections. She gets enough votes to stop Democrats winning. And if Trump wins next time round, it will probably be because Jill Stein got enough people to take votes away from the Democrats. There's quite a lot of people who do believe in this degrowth movement. I'll take the bait. Putting aside whether Jill Stein is choosing the president, which 
definitely we can debate. There are definitely some examples of proposals that have been made in mainstream outlets that I think are dangerous. For example, anybody who says anything that remotely sounds like we should get off fossil fuels immediately globally, you're talking about coal, I think, is well over half of China's energy. There's still well over a billion people in that country, many of them still living at or close to the margins. What happens if we turn their lights off? That's not going to be good for humanity. Stopping growth, degrowth thing, when you're talking about doing that on purpose, certainly in developing countries, certainly in middle income countries, and maybe even in rich countries, if you think about how that effect would cascade into other places that buy our goods and sell to us and things like that. I think you are talking about something that's dangerous. On the other hand, and I've actually written about this a few years ago, while I think it is certainly true and convincing the story in economics and political science that says that growth has been really important, not only to material and human well-being progress, but even to things like moral progress by making our society not zero sum. That does not on its own imply an answer to whether or not economic growth is biophysically sustainable. It makes me really hope that the answer is it is, but just logically, it's a separate question. And then I think there's a third school of thought that's come out of economics in the last five to 10 years that argues that in rich countries, structural forces that have nothing to do with the environment, like declining birth rates and shifts from goods to services, are slowing down our growth in kind of an inevitable way. Kind of like tipping points. I think we should prepare our societies to be resilient to a slower growth future like we're already seeing in places like Japan and Italy and since the pandemic, large parts of Europe, even Canada to some extent. But I think where the degrowth people have it wrong logically is the idea that even if you assume the answer as they do to the question of is growth biophysically sustainable, and I think that that's an open debate, even if you assume that they're right that the answer is it's not. The solution should be to focus on environmental impacts and then see what happens with growth. If you say we're emitting too much carbon and we're doing so because we're addicted to growth, the solution shouldn't be turn growth off. It should be do what you can to turn carbon off and see what happens. <laughs> that philosophy is what critics of degrowth call agrowth. But if the environment is the reason you want degrowth, then let's just focus on the environment. So that's what I would say about that. Now, to push back on some of the discourse, that comes from groups that you would call lukewarmers. Sometimes I think they can themselves underestimate the progress on renewables. So for example, in some of his writings, Bjorn Lomborg has quoted models from people like Bill Nordhaus that say that the optimal amount of warming is something between three and a half and four degrees. Well, if current policies are taking us underneath that, if current policies are taking us to say two and a half to three degrees, and we haven't internalized the carbon externality, there's probably something wrong with that analysis. The most charitable interpretation of it would be that there's huge positive externalities from cheap energy and economic development in poor countries. And if we could make that materialize, then that might increase our carbon footprint. And maybe that would be offset in the cost benefit analysis by the extra warming that we have. Even if that's true, I would say the main issue preventing more development in today's poorest countries is much more governance than its absence of fossil fuels. And so kind of like the degrowthers, I would say, if you think that the optimal amount of warming is higher than we think because we would love to develop poor countries, then let's focus on developing poor countries and see what happens. And I'm optimistic, maybe more so than Bjorn is, about how technological improvement and technological transfer might make the development of today's poor countries less dirty than our development was. And that's actually a really common pattern throughout history, that successive countries that develop, develop much cleaner than countries that developed beforehand because of things like technological improvement and tech transfer. So let's talk more about policies then, because you're talking about policies that are unhelpful. But what are the policies that you think should be accelerated? You mentioned externalities. So are you an advocate of a more effective carbon tax, for example, and other technological and financial support for adaptation in developing countries? Yeah. So I have signed two petitions in my professional life. If I have a friend and colleague who says, you should only sign a petition if you would be okay being the only person signing the petition, which I think is a great mantra. The two petitions I've signed are the economist statement on carbon taxes 
and the Stanford Academic Freedom Declaration. <laughs> so regarding carbon taxes, the economic evidence that those at least theoretically are the most efficient way to create incentives is a convincing case. I think that there are concerns about them raising prices or exacerbating inequality can be offset if you spend the money in the right ways, or if you take the revenue from the tax and recycle it into the economy, for example, or use it to make progressive investments. Now, that said, there's one time where I was at a conference and I made that case and a political scientist stood up and said, well, your policy doesn't exist and mine does, referring to clean energy standards in the United States and pointing out that carbon taxes and taxes in general often don't have great politics. And I think that that's a reasonable point that we don't always live in what economists would call a first best world in terms of efficiency. And there are other types of policies that can help. A couple that I think are interesting that we've seen in the US, although I don't actually think we have a great handle on measuring their effects, are clean energy standards and also industrial policies like the Inflation Reduction Act, where I think there's this interaction between the private sector and the public sector. If you talk to people who work in clean energy, they'll say that the early clean energy standards in places like California sent a huge market signal that spurred investment in renewables. And what we're seeing in terms of the amazing technological progress that's visible to us now is downstream from that. On the other hand, there are economists who say, well, if you look at when these policies were adopted, the curve for emissions didn't bend down that quickly in places like California, and the electricity prices rose a little bit. So maybe those policies weren't so great. I think we're about to have a similar conversation with the Inflation Reduction Act, where to a person, everyone I've talked to who works in renewable energy says it's a game changer in terms of the investment signals it's sending. But if you look at things like transmission constraints, the disappointing in some ways uptake of electric vehicles that we've seen in the United States, and there's some people who say policies like that aren't working as well as we think. I guess where I'm going with this is if we're going to be optimistic about technological improvement, we need to recognize that the early stages of technological improvement in areas that have a public benefit do tend to be supported by the government. And there's different ways that the government can do that. Certainly subsidies is one investing in places like university research for early stage stuff. But then I think there also needs to be a light enough touch that we're not picking winners too early. We're not like the United States government did about 20 years ago, going all in on biofuels and then realizing five years later, whoops, biofuels aren't actually that great for carbon. I guess there's a lot of work to be done on policy, but the right question to be asking if you're a researcher or a policymaker is, how do you have a light enough touch that you allow the private industry and free enterprise to do its thing, but also enough support for technological improvement to capitalize on the fact that the market isn't good at taking really risky early stage technologies and developing it? We kind of have to get out of the way of some of the energy technologies that are mature, but then anticipate what's the next, what's the electric vehicle or the solar cell 20 years ago now? And maybe it's things like carbon capture, for example, or modular nuclear as two examples. Yeah, that's a very good summary of that. And that's a good run around the climate change debate. Before we finish, I really want to give you a chance to say your thing about populism, because I really like the claim that you make that we're not on a one way road that just gets worse and worse and worse until we go to war. I've long been persuaded that populism has happened before. And it always goes, well, almost always goes one or two ways. Either the populists become disgraced and ridiculous, like Joe McCarthy did, or they are in power long enough that they have to find external enemies who are powerful enough that the war that it leads to is devastating. And Hitler was a populist. World War II was devastating. And the great conversation here is which way is the current wave of populism going to go? And it seems to me more likely on balance it's going to go the first way the populace will be disgraced and removed. That's already happened to some degree in the UK, where Boris Johnson was removed and is largely viewed as disgraced. And maybe the same thing will happen in America. Very often, these things can be cyclical rather than one way. What's your evidence for thinking that people are fed up with it and will want decent politicians back again? So let me give you some theory and some data. The analogy that I use is hard drugs. When hard drugs come into a community, it starts off with a small minority of people, and most people are kind of apathetic and disengaged. Super polarizing stuff is the same. 
it's a very small number of people on far right and far left that are driving most of the outrage, say, online. And most everyone's kind of disengaged. Now, the way that extremism can suck people in is it gives voice and often simplistic solutions to problems that are real. If you talk about the far left stuff that happened in 2020, it was, I think, pretty universally seen now as being destructive and particularly unhelpful to the very communities that it was supposed to be about. You're talking about things like defunding the police. And the violent riots and the police demonization and the DAs pulling back. There are many things that contributed to the crime wave other than literally defunding the police. But that zeitgeist happened because it gave voice to something which was real, or a couple things that are real. One is that there is still too much police brutality in America. And there's a debate about whether shootings are racially biased, but non-lethal use of force, there's a lot of evidence that that is racially biased. And then also, if you go back to 2015, it gave voice to the fact that there was this great hope when Barack Obama was elected twice to be president that basically we had solved racism and that we were entering this post-racial society. And I think it was very clear to many people looking at the material conditions at the end of his time in office that actually, no, we had an African-American president and that's great, but no, we have not solved the racial problems in the United States. And then on the right, similar kinds of things. For example, unchecked illegal immigration. And there have been record crossings at the southern border during the Biden administration. And whatever you think about the morality of how much immigration we should be having and all that, and there's lots of different views on that, it has had a challenging impact on the infrastructure and the school systems and the city budgets in several American major cities. And similarly, the cultural shifts that people call wokeness left a lot of people, working class people of all races, but working class white people maybe in particular, feeling disenfranchised at a time where they had been just devastated economically by things like deindustrialization. So it draws its power from real problems. People worrying about the declining standing of the United States in the world, going from being the hegemon to being the power that couldn't fix the Middle East and maybe is now threatened by China geopolitically. And hard drugs is kind of the same thing. Hard drugs sucks people in often who are vulnerable, who have real problems, um, and it offers them easy answers and dopamine hits. Isn't it so much easier and more fun in the short term to dunk on people on Twitter rather than fix these hard problems that have complex intertwined causes? But I think hard drugs is also a good analogy for the weakness of political extremism which is that it's not very good at delivering results for the issues that it draws its power from. If you're somebody who doesn't like the perceived decline in American power, and you wish that patriotism was less controversial than it seems to be in some corners of academia, seeing people lighting fires in the Capitol building doesn't make you feel better about American patriotism, at least most people. If you're a Christian who feels disenfranchised by some of the cultural trends and the secularization in America, you may like Trump the attack dog, but Trump the Christian isn't very convincing. <laughs> Think about the way he lives his life. And same thing on the other side. To pick two examples, the long-term lockdowns and school closures and the broader move against prosecution and policing following 2020 I think there's an empirical case to be made that those are two of the worst things to happen, at least in a decade, to the most marginalized minority communities in the United States. And they were perpetrated by the very people who claim to be their friends. And broadly, people just get tired. Polarization is exhausting. Dysfunctional governing is exhausting. And again, like hard drugs, the average person who's disengaged, eventually extremism creates quality of life issues that wakes them up and are like, no, we're not going to put up with what's going on in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, for example. We're not going to put up with some of the extreme election denying stuff. And the evidence that that's happening, if you look, for example, at the midterms in 2022, it was supposed to be a big red wave and it wasn't. And disproportionately, the candidates that underperformed were candidates who were latching on to some of the more extreme aspects of Trumpism, the election denial, and that kind of stuff. Same thing on the left. Jamal Bowman, you know, a member of the squad, just lost a Democratic primary in the Bronx to a 70-year-old white guy who called him a racist. 
that wouldn't have happened in 2020. In 2021, Seattle was so fed up with their crime wave that they elected a Republican district attorney, one of the most liberal cities in the entire country. And you know what? I went to Seattle for a conference a few months ago, and the downtown is as clean as I've ever seen it. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if those things are related. If you look at businesses, businesses were kind of pushed to take polarizing political positions, and they're pulling back from that as they're getting punished in the marketplace for doing so. Those are just some examples. For more, I encourage you all to go to guidedcivicrevival.substack.com and read my essay, How Polarization Will Destroy Itself. So would you care to give us a forecast of who's going to win the election then, based on your evidence and your views about the pullback of populism? You know, Nate Silver, I think, has it as a toss-up right now, about a 50-50 toss-up. I have no reason to think that he's wrong about that. So I'm going to dodge your question a little bit. If you had to make me pick, I would say I think Harris is slightly more likely than Trump to win the election partly because these long-term trends are against polarization and against chaos. And although I don't think she's the perfect moderate candidate that the Democrats could have put forward, I think she much more represents stability than former President Trump does. However, I will forecast that either way, the long-term trends that I described are probably going to continue. So even if former President Trump wins re-election, I think it's unlikely that he's going to have a huge red wave in Congress that's going to allow him to implement whatever he wants. Even if he does, and this happened in his previous administration, rank and file Republicans are going to, some quietly, some more loudly, push back on some of the more extreme parts of his agenda. So for example, if you're concerned about climate change, when he was in office last time, his White House budget request had huge cuts to climate science every year that he was in power. And the final budget in Congress, which in some years was passed by Republicans, always increased the budget for federal climate science. Partly that was a story of Republicans like Colorado Senator Cory Gardner understanding that the huge majority of Americans want something done about climate change if the alternative is nothing. And there are a lot of places where clean energy jobs and climate science jobs are hugely important to the economy. Things like the Inflation Reduction Act, whatever you think about that bill, most of the money from it is going to Republican districts because that's where you build solar and wind. And so I think that some of the more extreme aspects of Trump's agenda or Project 2025, whether or not that's Trump's agenda, which is a debate, are going to be harder to pass even in a second Trump term, which people worry will be more extreme than a first Trump term. Cool. Well, thank you for coming off the fence. It was a brave and honest thing to do. And actually, I find myself pretty much in agreement with you about that. This has been a really interesting run around climate change and populism. Matt, I want to thank you very much for coming on to the London Futurist podcast. Thanks, guys, for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.